Okay, in this first problem, we're looking at a ball with a mass of one kilogram falling onto a slanted surface. In order to find out what the velocity is for the ball at point B, we're going to use conservation of energy because we know it's falling a distance of two meters. So conservation of energy says that the potential energy, which is mgh, here at point A, will equal the kinetic energy that exists at point B, which is one-half mv squared. And you'll notice that the masses cancel out, so it doesn't matter how massive the ball is, it's going to strike point B at the same speed. And so 2gh is equal to v squared, and so the velocity, and I'll even label it at point B, is equal to 6.264 meters per second. And I should point out at this point in time, it has been known for me to make a mistake on calculations, so you should always check through my calculations to make sure I have the right numbers. And let me just mention again, h is equal to 2 meters. I didn't state that before, but we have that. Now, the ball is now at point B, and it strikes the incline. Since it's a collision, we're going to use momentum, more specifically we're going to use the coefficient of restitution because the two things that collide are the ball and the slope and the slope is not moving at all. So I need to set up first off I already have an x and a y coordinate system and I'm going to need that but more importantly for this collision I'm going to need a normal which is perpendicular to the surface so I'll say that E normal is in that direction E tangential then is right along the surface. Now keep in mind from momentum we know that the component of the velocity tangent to the surface doesn't change. But the normal velocity will change based on the coefficient of restitution which is given at 0 0.55. So I need to take V sub B which is straight down. So let's say V sub B is right here and I'm going to break it down into its normal component and its tangential component. Now since this angle here is 30 degrees, I can draw a right triangle. This will be 60 degrees. This will be 30 degrees. I know these are at right angles, so that means that this will be 60 degrees. And finally, this will be 30 degrees. So it turns out then that the tangential component of this velocity, V tangential, will equal V sub B tangential is in this direction, times a sine of 30 degrees. And so that's 6.264 meters per second times one half, which of course is a sine of 30 degrees. So the tangential velocity would be 3.132 meters per second. The normal component, V normal, will equal V sub B times the cosine of 30 degrees. And you'll notice the normal component is into the incline, whereas E normal is out of the incline. So the normal component is going to be negative. We'll put a minus sign there. So 6.264 meters per second times the cosine of 30 degrees is 5.425 meters per second. And let's not forget the minus sign. So now I know the component of the velocity normal to the surface before the collision with the surface is 5.425. Now I can use the coefficient of restitution equation to figure out what the velocity is afterward, the normal component of the velocity. So restitution says E is equal to U sub A normal minus U sub B normal over v sub b normal minus v sub a normal. And in our case, the ball is a, and b is actually the incline itself, which is, of course, not moving. So this will be u sub a normal, which I'm looking for, minus 0, all divided by v sub b, but that's the incline, so it's not moving, minus a minus, 5.425 meters per second. And all of that's going to equal 0 0.55, which is our E value.
So this minus and that minus will cancel to give me a plus. And I'll end up with u sub a normal. That's normal component of ball A after it hits the ground. And that will be 2.9837 meters per second. Now I need to look at orientation again. So u tangential is this way. u normal is this way. And my velocity of the ball after the collision is equal to 3.132 e tangential plus 2.9837 e normal. But what I really want to do is I want to turn this into a polar velocity. So that's going to be the magnitude of ua. So u sub a magnitude is 3.132 meters per second quantity squared plus 2.9837 meters per second quantity squared all under the radical. That will be the magnitude of my velocity. And then it's going to create an angle theta. So theta t is the angle with respect to the tangential unit vector. And that will be the arc tangent of 2.9837 divided by 3.132. So the velocity will be coming off here like this. And this will be theta with respect to the tangential. And so I can write my u sub a in this format. This will be 4.326 meters per second at an angle of 43.6 degrees. Now that 43.6 degrees is theta sub t. Well, let's keep in mind that the x-axis is this way. And the angle between E tangential and the x-axis is 30 degrees. So with respect to the x-y coordinate system, I can write the velocity of A after the collision as 4.326 meters per second. The speed doesn't change. There's no difference in speed regardless of what your coordinate system is. But the angle in the x-y coordinate system will be 13.6 degrees. That is to say, 43.6 degrees, which is this whole thing. Take away this 30 right here. So the 13.6 degrees is in here. And at this point, that's what I want. I want the x and y coordinates. And so u sub a in the x-y coordinate system is going to be 4.204 in the i-hat direction plus 1.018 in the j-hat direction, meters per second. Now the reason I want the x-y coordinate system is because I'm interested in where the ball lands down here at point C. I want to know what this distance D is. In order to do that, I need to know the x component and the y component of its landing spot. And so I can now use projectile motion to get the answer to that question. So x is equal to the x velocity, which we know to be 4.204 meters per second times t. y is equal to the y component of the velocity, 1.01 meters per second t minus 1 half gt squared. But there's three unknowns here. I don't know x, I don't know y, and I don't know t. So I need another equation. But if we look at the slope of this line as it goes down here, that's at an angle of minus 30 degrees, and it's a straight line. So y, so you have a straight line at a slope down of 30 degrees. The equation of that line is y equals mx plus b, but the slope is the tangent of negative 30 degrees times x. And so now I have three equations in three unknowns. And so as I look at this the way I want to solve this, I'm going to substitute into here tangent minus 30 degrees times x equals 1.018 meters per second times t. But if I look at this equation, t is equal to x over 4.204 meters per second minus 1 half 9.81 meters per second squared times t squared, which is x over 4.204 
meters per second. That whole quantity is T, so that's T squared. And so as I work this out, I'm going to get minus 0 0.57735x equals 0 0.2421. No units there. X, there's no units here. That's the tangent of minus 30 degrees. It has no units. Here the meters per second cancel out. Minus 0 0.2775. That's going to be meters to the minus 1 for units. X squared. And so if I bring this term to the left and this term to the left, I'm going to get 0 0.2775 meters to the minus 1 x squared minus 0 0.8195, no units there, x equal to 0. I can pull an x out in front of the whole thing. If I do that, my square goes away and that x goes away. And so my solutions are x equal to 0, which makes sense. That's just at the impact point. I already know that. And the other one is going to be x equal to 0 0.8195, all divided by 0 0.2775 meters to the minus 1. Of course, that's in the denominator, so when I bring it up, I'm going to get meters, which is what I want. So 0.2775, and that's going to give me... I'll write it up here, x is going to equal to 2.953 meters. And I'm interested in d, which is here. Here's x, there's x right there. And so x over d is equal to the cosine of 30. So d is equal to x over the cosine of 30. And so d is equal to 3.41 meters. In this problem, we have an amusement park ride going around in a circle and it's changing its distance from the pivot point which is right here. So I've got kind of a circular path going on so that really kind of tells me circular motion or in this case angular momentum is really what I want to concentrate on. So the weight of the car mg is equal to 165 pounds. The initial position r0 of the boom is equal to 16 feet. The car is moving in a horizontal circular path, so the radius is not yet changing, and so the speed is equal to 32 feet per second. Since it's currently circular, this is a tangential velocity, so that's going to be just in the tangential direction. Then I begin to shorten the boom by 3 feet per second. So there's a radial component to the velocity now, and that's going to be equal to 3 feet per second. And I want to know the speed of the car when the radius has been cut down to 13 feet. So I'm interested in the speed at r equal to 13 feet. And keep in mind, speed is the magnitude of the velocity. So I'll come back to that just in a second. The force, the only force is along the radial component. And so what that means is angular momentum will not change. Remember, angular momentum is equal to the derivative with respect to time of moment. But there is no moment. The only force is along r. And since the only force is along r, r cross f, the derivative with respect to time of r cross f, that's going to be equal to 0 because r cross f is equal to 0. And what that tells me is the angular momentum which is r cross mv, that's going to be constant. But r cross mv, there's a velocity in this direction and a velocity in this direction. But when I do a cross product with the radius, which is off in this direction, so there's r, and there's part of the mv, this is the tangential part, and this here is going to be the normal part, r cross the normal velocity is zero. They're anti-parallel. Only mv tangential then will give me a component for the angular momentum. And so the angular momentum is r m v tangential. And that's a constant. So the angular momentum at the first position, which I'm going to call 0, r0, vt0, which is right here. There's r0. That's going to equal r later on. Call that r1. Same mass. And then the tangential component of the velocity later on. 
All right, so the masses go away. The initial radius is 16 feet. The initial tangential velocity is 32 feet per second. And later on, I've got a radius of 13 feet. And what I'm interested in then is the tangential velocity at that 13 foot mark, all right, so VT1. Well, that's easy to figure out. So VT1 is going to equal 16 feet times 32 feet per second divided by 13 feet. And that's 39.4 meters per second. But keep in mind, that's only the tangential component. There's also a normal component of minus 3 feet per second. And so the speed, V, the magnitude of the velocity, and that's going to equal 39.4 feet per second squared plus negative 3 feet per second squared, all under the radical. Okay, they're components just like the other stuff, and so they're going to be, they're going to be legs of a right triangle. So 39.4 squared plus 9, and then the square root, and I'm going to get 39.5, which is really close to 39.4. We're going to get 39.5 meters per second. So you got to be careful on mastering engineering you could end up with 39.4 forgetting this 3 feet per second and it might give you the right uh, correct response. It might tell you you are correct. If you had 39.4 it might say yeah you're pretty close but you've really forgotten the normal component of the velocity and that's kind of important. Find the work done by the axial force along the boom. Remember that that force is the only force doing work. And so let's just keep in mind that the most simple definition for work is kinetic energy 2 minus kinetic energy 1. And actually in my case, the most simple definition for work is T1 minus T0. And so that's going to equal 1 half, 165 pounds over G times 39.5 feet per second squared minus 1 half. 165 pounds over G times 32 feet per second squared. 4,022 pound feet minus 2623 and 624 pound feet, and that's going to equal 1399 pound feet, roughly 1400 pound feet. And that's my final answer for the work done. Okay, this problem was part of your in-class group quiz. So we have an Indy car racer. We know that the velocity of the car racer is 72.5 meters per second to the left. That's where the minus sign is. That's in the I direction, and that's at point A. And it moves around the track. The track has a radius of curvature, 256 meters. The center is right here. It moves around the track until it reaches here. And we know that the angle in between here is 36.9 degrees. I'm just going to call that theta. And the reason that I use 36.8699 for my theta value is that this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. 3, 4, 5. And there's theta in there. I know the mass of the car, 1230 kilograms. And it's slowing down. So this is a tangential acceleration. And the tangential acceleration is constant. So A tangential equals 7.25 meters per second squared, and it's slowing down, so that must be negative. All right, so here's point B. The first question is, how far is it from point A to point B? And I mean along the track. That's an arc length, and so S equals R theta, and that's going to equal 256 meters. And then 36.87 degrees rounding that off a little bit. It's going to leave me with an angle in here of 53.13 degrees. But when I do S equals R theta, I don't want degrees, I want radians. So I multiply this by pi over 180 degrees. And so I get an arc length of 237.387 meters. And I'm going to get a little ridiculous with significant digits here because I'm going to be using these numbers over and over again. What is the velocity of the racer car at point B? Well, since I have a constant tangential acceleration along the curve, I can use constant acceleration equations. And so V sub B squared equals V sub A squared plus 2A delta S. And I'm going to use S because this is an arc length. And so V sub B squared equals 
72.5 meters per second. And that's negative, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in because I'm squaring it. Plus 2 times the acceleration, which is negative 7.25 meters per second squared. And the distance I just traveled, I just discovered. So that's 237.387 meters. So VB squared is 1814 meters squared per second squared. So V sub B is going to be the square root of that, which is 42.6 meters per second. Now that's the speed. So the velocity is going to be in that direction. So in the normal tangential system, the velocity vector is equal to 42.6 meters per second e tangential. In the Cartesian system, I have to know these angles, but if this is 53 degrees, then this is 53 degrees, and this is 53 degrees. So the velocity in the tangential is going to be to the left, that's the cosine of 53 degrees, which is 0.6. So this will equal 0 0.6, 42.6 meters per second in the i-hat direction, and that's to the left, so that's negative, plus, because it's upward, the sine of that 53 degrees is 0 0.8 and 42.6 meters per second, and that's in the j-hat. This conversion from one coordinate system to another is important, so you really need to know how to do that. So my velocity, then, is equal to going to equal minus 25.56 in the i plus 34.07 in the j meters per second. So here's my normal tangential. Velocity is only ever in the tangential. You will never have a normal component to velocity. And here's the xy, Cartesian, if you will, velocity. So the acceleration of the racer at point B, we already know the tangential component of the acceleration is minus 7.25 meters per second squared. We're interested in the normal component then as well, and that's equal to the speed squared over the radius. And the speed, keep in mind, is 42.6 meters per second, so 42.6 meters per second, and I'm going to square that. And I divide by the radius, which is 256 meters. And when I do that, it's 7.086 meters per second squared. So the acceleration is equal to minus 7.25 e tangential plus 7.086 e normal meters per second squared. Now, I want to take advantage of this for a second. Keep in mind, my E tangential is this way, my E normal is that way, and I know that this angle is about 53 degrees. So here's E tangential, E normal, and what this acceleration is going to be then still in the tangential normal is 10.14 meters per second squared, and then at an angle in this direction of minus 45.65 degrees. Now this is 53, so this must be 37 degrees. And so minus 45 is actually going to put it down here a little bit. So there's minus 45 degrees. And so what I can do to get this into the Cartesian system, since I know this is 37 degrees, so this angle in here is going to be 8.78 degrees. So the acceleration in the Cartesian system is 10.14 meters per second squared at an angle of minus 8.78 degrees. And that's going to be 10.02 meters per second squared in the I minus 1.55 meters per second squared in the J. So there's my acceleration in both systems. How much time did the car take to go from A to B? Well, I know the distance is 237 meters, 237.387 meters, and that's going to equal the initial velocity, 
72.5 meters per second t minus one half 7.25 meters per second squared t squared. That's just the constant acceleration equation. X equals V naught T minus one half A T squared. We've seen that equation before. This is simply a quadratic equation. And if I did this correctly, I get T equals 4.13 seconds. The angular momentum at point B, angular momentum, point B with respect to the center is equal to R cross mv. Now if I don't want to worry about cross product, it's just going to be the radius, which is 256 meters times the mass, which is 1230 kilograms, times the velocity at b, which is 42.6 meters per second. And I get 13,413,888 kilogram meters squared per second. So that's at b, or h0 at b. Now, how do I get away with not worrying about the vectors. Keep in mind mv, v tangential, all of these are tangential, is always perpendicular to the radius vector. And since they're perpendicular, the magnitude is just going to be rmv. Now what about the direction? Since I'm going around in a counterclockwise direction, that would indicate to me then that h0v was equal to minus 13,400,000 kilogram meters squared per second in the k hat direction. Right hand rule, curl your fingers in that direction on your right hand and your thumb is going to point into the board or into the screen. The angular momentum at A, because now I'm interested in the angular impulse, that's just the change in the angular momentum, that's going to equal 256 times 1230, except this will be 72.5 meters per second, and I get minus 22,828,800 kilogram meters squared per second, also in the k direction. In order to find the impulse then, it's h0b minus h0a, let's use vectors there, so b minus a, I'm going to end up with 9,400,000 and 14,912 kilogram meters squared per second in the k-hat direction. And that is positive because I'm going from a very negative number to a less negative number, so the change must be positive. So the average moment, well remember that the integral of moment dt is h0b minus h0a, but there's H0B minus H0A, so the average moment is going to be 9,414,912 kilogram meters squared per second in the k-hat direction. And then I divide by the delta T, which we already know is 4.13 seconds. And so this is equal to 2,280,000. I have kilogram meters squared per second per second, and so that's kilogram meters squared per second squared, which is a newton meter, which is the proper unit for a moment. And of course that's in the k hat direction. Now it should be that the moment is also equal to r cross f, where f is the net force, or r cross m a, but only the tangential component of the acceleration counts. And so this should be 256 meters times the mass, which is 1230 kilograms, times the acceleration, which is 7.25. And indeed, when I work that out, let me just run through this one more time, 256 meters, 1230 kilograms, 7.25 meters per second squared, I do in fact get 2,282,880. So that's what it should be. The magnitude of the average force creating that moment is simply ma. So that's 1230 kilograms times 7.25 meters per second squared. I'm only interested in magnitudes here. Keep in mind, that's the average force creating that moment. There is more force there, 
because there's a frictional force keeping it in the circle, but that doesn't create any moment because that's along the radius. And the R cross MA for the normal component of acceleration, A normal is along R in the circular path at any rate, and so it cannot apply a moment. So 1230 times 7.25 is 8917, call it 8920 newtons. How much work is done from A to B? I can do one half mass times velocity at B squared minus one half mass velocity at A squared, but the velocity at B is 42.6 meters per second, so we'll square that. The velocity of A was 72.5 meters per second, we square that. I'm going to subtract that out multiply by the 1230 kilograms, that's the mass, and then times one half, and I get the work done is minus 2,116,516 joules, negative because it's slowing down, but if you think about it, that better be equal to the, the net force of 8920 newtons, that's slowing it down, times the distance, which is 237.387 meters, and indeed it's pretty close within round off error, 2,116,898 joules. So there's a little bit of round off in there, but they are essentially the same value, which they should be. What did that work? The only thing touching the car is the road. So the road must be what's doing the work on the car. Okay, as we take a look at this problem, this is going to be a very simple application of conservation of energy. A is up here. I'm going to make the datum for A right there. It really doesn't matter because A doesn't go up or down, but I'll do it there anyway for completeness. B, I'm going to put the datum there. So in the initial situation, A and B have no gravitational potential energy. What the spring does, the spring has a certain amount of potential energy, and then A and B both have kinetic energy in the beginning. So B is twice A, so B has two boxes of kinetic energy, A has one, and we'll say that the spring has one box of potential energy. And since A and B are both at their datums, their gravitational potential energy is zero. A little bit later, a hasn't done anything, so the gravitational potential energy of A remains the same. This should be a B here. Gravitational potential energy of B, however, has fallen, so it's actually going to be negative. The spring is stretched even more, so we'll give it two boxes. And I don't really know if A and B are speeding up or slowing down. I'm going to assume they're speeding up, so let's give this one two boxes, and this one would be four boxes. And so I have one, two, three, four boxes on the left. And so I need four boxes on the right. Well, I've got eight up and one down, but I want eight up and four down. So let's just add three more boxes here. Remember, the number of boxes is really irrelevant as long as the left side equals the right side. And then I put equations. So I've got zero plus zero plus one half K L one squared, where L is the length from equilibrium, plus one-half m sub a v sub a squared, plus one-half m sub b v sub b squared. But since a and b are attached by a simple cord, the speed of a, granted, one's to the right and one's down, but I only care about speed, the speed of a is equal to the speed of b. And then later on, there's still no gravitational potential energy for A, minus the mass of B, G, times Y of B. The minus sign's already taken into account the fact that it's fallen, plus one-half the mass of A, V of A squared, which I'm just going to label as V, plus one-half the mass of B, V squared. They're the same V, so don't, no worries there, plus spring can the spring potential energy, one-half k L2 squared. Now the length of the spring, I'm going to find that by using the Pythagorean theorem. So L1 is equal to 0.3 meters 
squared plus 0.15 meters squared, all under the radical, minus the 0 0.1 meters. So there is the length initially. Remember, the unstressed length is 0.1 meters, so I subtract that from this total length of the spring. Now, in the first part of this problem, B has fallen 0.211 meters, which means A has moved to the right 0.211 meters. So L2 will equal, still using the Pythagorean theorem, 0.3 and 0.211. That's going to be 0.511 meters squared plus 0.15 meters squared, that's the height right here, all under the radical, minus 0 0.1 meters. So there's the second length after it's fallen, 0 0.211 meters. So when I work this out, I get L1 is equal to 0 0.2354 meters, and L2 is 0 0.432 five, six meters. We're putting these numbers into our equations, I get one half, 7.25 newtons per meter, 0 0.2354 meters squared, that's one half kx squared, potential energy of the spring, plus one half. Now I'm just going to combine both of these masses together because VA and VB are the same. So 14 kilograms and 28, so that's 42 kilograms. And I started off at 1 meter per second squared. So there's my initial energy. And in the end, it's going to be 1 half 725 newtons per meter times 0.43256 meters, and that's squared, minus B has fallen 0.211 meters, so 14 kilograms, 28 kilograms, 9.80 meters per second squared, 0.211 meters, plus one half, 42 kilograms, times the unknown velocity squared. So that's 20.09 joules, plus 21 joules. Okay, here's 20.09, here's 21, so 41. 0 0.09 joules to begin with, and my spring is 67.8 joules minus 57.898 joules plus 21 kilograms times v squared. So this is going to be 9.93 joules, and I need to bring that to the other side, and I'm going to get 31.16 joules equals 21 kilograms times V squared, and so V is going to equal 1.22 meters per second. Now in part two, they want to know how far it falls before it stops. My initial situation is still 41.09 joules, so that won't change, but then that will equal 1 half 725 newtons per meter times L3 squared minus 14 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared times y3 plus the kinetic energies which are going to be zero because they've stopped but l3 is this new length here now this is going to be 0.3 meters plus y3 in other words it started off at 0.3 meters and now it's been pushed to the right by another y3 meters, and this is going to be 0.15 meters. So L3 squared is equal to 0.15 meters squared plus 0.3 meters plus y3 squared. So let's just say L3 is all of that under the radical. But then I need to subtract 0 0.1 meters because that's the equilibrium length. So this beautiful function is going to go in here for L3. The only unknown then in this whole equation is Y3. So I'm going to get 41.09 joules equals 1 half, 725 newtons per meter, and then the square root of 0.15 meters squared plus 0.3 meters 
plus y3 squared minus 0 0.1 meters, all of that squared, minus 14 kilograms, 9.80 meters per second squared, y3. And so I have one unknown, and I can solve that out. It's going to take some work. I would do this on a spreadsheet or something. And I don't know what we're going to get. So I'll let you do that. Aren't you lucky? All right, final question for this long lecture. I have an 80-pound boy sitting in a 20-pound wagon. So let's just call the mass of the wagon 100 pounds because the boy is never going to be out of the wagon. And he's going to simulate rocket propulsion by throwing bricks. Now, the idea here is that I have bricks with a mass and actually a weight of 10 pounds. So this should be the mass of the wagon times g, and this will be the mass of the bricks times g. And he can throw them at 10 feet per second, but that's relative to the wagon. So the velocity of the bricks relative to the wagon is equal to 10 feet per second. And I'm going to assume he's throwing them to the left. Now, conservation of momentum says, since he starts from rest, the initial momentum is zero. That's going to equal the mass of the wagon times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. Okay, momentum is always going to assume a velocity with respect to the ground. Plus the mass of the bricks times the velocity of the bricks with respect to the ground. So the velocity of the brick with respect to the ground, that's going to equal the velocity of the brick with respect to the wagon plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. Note my subscript. So zero equals the mass of the wagon, velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground plus the mass of the brick, velocity of the brick with respect to the wagon, but that's minus 10 feet per second, plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. Now notice I can multiply everybody by g for gravity and just use weights, and it's not going to matter as far as my solution goes. So let's throw one brick. So 0 equals the mass of the wagon times g, which is 100 pounds, times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground, plus 10 pounds, that's the mass of the brick, times g, and I better make a change here. This is going to be 120 pounds, because there's still two bricks inside the wagon, times minus 10 feet per second, plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to g. So this 10 and this 10 will add, multiply to give me minus 100, and I'm going to bring that then to the left side of the equation. So I get 100 pound feet per second equals 120 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. That's this term right here. And then I need to keep this term, which is multiplied by the 10 pounds also. So plus 10 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. And so this equals 130 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. So the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground equals 100 pound feet per second over 130 pounds, which is 10 over 13 feet per second. And I'm just going to leave it as 10 over 13. So there's the first brick now thrown. Let's throw again. Throw number two. I have 120 pounds now because the first brick is gone times 10 over 13 feet per second. And that's going to equal 110 pounds. That's what's left over after I throw the next brick times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. This is a new VWG plus 10 pounds. That's the brick I just threw. That's brick number two. Minus 10 feet per second plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. So over here I have 1,200 over 13 pound feet per second. Here I'm going to have 100 pound feet per second, which is 1,300 over 13, I just want a common denominator, pound feet per second, 
bringing that to the other side of the equation clearly. Maybe not so clearly, but that's what I'm doing. And on the right side, I have 110 pounds times VWG and 10 pounds plus 10 pounds VWG. So that's 120 pounds VWG. And so VWG equals 2,500, 1,200 plus 1,300 over 13. And then I'm going to divide by the 120. So let me just bring 120. The pounds will cancel. And I'll be left with feet per second. So this is 250 over those zeros have canceled, hence 250. And then 12 over 13 is 156. Last throw, I have 110 pounds. That's the boy in one brick times 250 over 156 feet per second. And that's going to equal 100 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground, plus 10 pounds, that's the last brick, times the minus 10 feet per second, plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. So I get 110 times 250 over 156 pound feet per second. And here's another 100, so I'm going to bring that over. So there's 100. I'm going to do 156 100 over 156. That's the same as 100, but I want a common denominator. Pound feet per second. So this is 43,100 divided by 156. All of that's going to equal 110 pounds times VWG. So just divide this by 110. And VWG equals 43,100 divided by 156 times 110. You'll notice the pounds will cancel out. So this will just be feet per second. This denominator is 17,160. And if I divide that into 43,100, I get 2.511, 2.512 feet per second. So that's throwing the bricks one at a time. One thing I'll point out, if we calculated out the velocity of each brick after I threw it to the left, I multiplied that by 10 pounds, and then I take VWG, 2.512 times 100 pounds, I'll end up with zero. That's the total momentum after the third throw. If I include all three bricks moving to the left, that's going to add up to zero, the, the initial momentum. All right, let's throw all the bricks at once. I have zero, so I start off with no velocity. That's going to equal 100 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground, plus 30 pounds, that's all three bricks at once, minus 10 feet per second, plus the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. So here's going to be 300 pound feet per second. It's negative, but I'm going to bring it to the other side of the equal sign. So it's going to be positive 300 pounds feet per second. And that's going to equal 100 pounds plus 30 pounds. So 130 pounds times the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground. And 300 divided by 130. Notice again the pounds go away. I have 300 divided by 130 then. And that's 2.31. So the velocity of the wagon with respect to the ground is 2.31 feet per second. Notice throwing all three bricks at once gives me 2.31 feet per second. But if I throw them one at a time, I get 2.512 feet per second, slightly more. And that will always be the case. If I decided to throw six five-pound bricks, it would be even faster than 2.512. Probably not a lot faster, but it would in fact be faster.